Love it or hate it, the neon aesthetic sets this film apart in the genre. Will Smith's workout routine. Again. Although last time he had a robotic arm, so no fair. You've gotta love all the classic music used in this film. They spent a crap ton of money on this soundtrack. For me, it's not jarring. It signifies a cut to a new character intro or scene. You know the rules, hotness. I've gotta give Ike Barinholtz a win. Every time he opens his mouth and is not Morgan Tukers, I'm impressed. Margot Robbie embodies Harley Quinn right from her first scene. And the use of neon with stretched and distorted footage to illustrate the inside of Harley's mind is fantastic. Spoilers? Good thing we all saw and loved Batman v Superman, eh? Right? You guys know you loved it. I'm sure he was paid handsomely, but good for you, Batfleck. A more prideful man wouldn't have done a cameo just to give your universe legitimacy. And this is the introduction of this film's main theme. I mean, obviously he's not going to shoot his daughter, but there's more going on with Deadshot's character arc that starts right here with what he does as much as with what he doesn't say. Love you, Daddy. Denzel, you know, I live for these moments with you. <laughs> Another consistent motif is how the edges of songs playing in her flashbacks speed up and slow down, messing with our sense of reality as much as hers. I mean, who's not gonna fall for that beautiful face? I'll probably catch some flack for this, but Jared Leto is always a win. Jordan Catalano won our hearts and then Harry Goldfarb broke them. And his mother's. And his arm. And then his angel face. Man, I love Jared Leto. Good on you for putting Harley in the Jester costume and even better on you for not keeping her in it. It would clearly not have played the same way it does in the cartoon, but we appreciate the nod. Pen? Come on, she said it! And it didn't suck. How did she make it not suck? Margot Robbie took a cartoon comic character and made her real. Who knew Batfleck was going to prove to be the coolest Batman? I think I remember calling it in my Man of Steel video. I love that the Joker is just gone. This is a comic book movie with comic book rules. And a great showcase of how crazy Harley actually is. Instead of, you know, trying to escape, she plays dead to get a stab at. Betsy, Betsy, Betsy. Batman, where gender equality takes on a whole new meaning. I also feel the need to point out that since this flashback takes place before Batman v Superman and presumably the death of Jason Todd, Batfleck isn't murdering people just yet. And he even tries to revive her. Oh no, another cameo by The Flash. What do they think this is, a comic book where random characters can just pop in for a second and then disappear? What? It is a comic book movie? David Ayer. I know that's not the most subtle little foreshadowing, but come on. Who's the real monster eating her rare steak? Which of course is... Monster shadowing. I'm sorry, I know this comes up on the list of what were they thinking pretty often, but these text intros are awesome. Each one is tailored to the villain with font choice and flow, and they're really comic booky. Also, Incubus currently in a jar and Golfs with a three handicap are great little additions you probably didn't notice in the first viewing that are evidence that this film doesn't take itself too seriously. What if Superman grabbed the President of the United States right out of the Oval Office? Uh, that sounds more like something Zod would have done. Wait a minute. Glad to see Annalise has gotten her drinking problem under control enough to give this presentation. And another thing that sets this film apart, even within the DCEU, is some actual creepy horror-style imagery. I mean, that's just cool! Are you the devil? Well... I ain't no weapon. I'm gonna die in peace before I raise my fist again. Turning over a new leaf. <laughs> Y'all jokers must be crazy. Dang it, I love this demonstration. Smith's excitement when he realizes the guns are functional and then the over-the-shoulder perfect accuracy while we shoot with him and then these glowing red perfect shot circles? What a scene! Darnell can't come. Darnell's out. He's out. I know not everyone is going to love Holder, Conway, Robocop as much as me, but I find him to be thoroughly entertaining. Go watch The Killing, that is all. Couple of things here. What sets the Joker's involvement in motion is that Harley didn't end up in Arkham, their usual place where they're constantly escaping. That's why he's depressed right now. He thought he'd leave her in the car, Batman would save her, and he'd go break her out. He may have even been contemplating suicide thinking he'd lost her, but now he has to get creative. Also, onesies? Was Harley pregnant? They send you to this swamp in Louisiana. You should feel right at home, Hoyt. I know there was some confusion over this scene, it moves fast, and it might seem like a flashback, but it's just the Joker buying Griggs debt so he can blackmail him into giving Harley the phone. That's it. It's not an unresolved plot thread, she uses the phone later. In fact, pretty much everything the Joker does outside of flashbacks is in the service of finding and rescuing Harley. I really like that. It's one of those nitpicky questions that would come up. What if you're dreaming and say her name accidentally? What if you try to say enchantment but cough halfway through and it sort of sounds like an S? This answers that. Enchantress will use whatever loophole she can. All the effects surrounding the Enchantress are believable and give her an aura that you just don't want to be around. Another creepy image that teeters on horror jump scare. Not commonplace in mainstream comic book movies. Except Spawn, I guess. Alright, so it's a blue beam to space. But it's got this spinning stuff all around it, and Incubus is tentacle killing NPCs. I'm entertained. So what's the deal with Scott Eastwood? He's not actually Clint's son, right? He's a clone, a la Boba Fett. Whatever, he's a decent sidekick. Huh? What was that? 
I should kill everyone and escape? <laughs> I'm kidding. Jeez. That's not what they really said. <laughs> Honesty. Hey, you want me to run blind mahjong with me, Nana? Shut up. You were caught robbing a diamond exchange. Oh, boy, what? Jai Courtney is awesome in this movie. I may have been exaggerating about my Batflick prediction, but I've always loved Jai. Here he is with one of the best performances in this film. Somebody might want to get him a red shirt. A gearing up montage set to Eminem is the fastest way to start looking dope. This is Katana. She's got my back. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. That little exposition dump gets torn apart. Why is she here? Why does she have flags back? Did you really need to just tell us her deal? What every single person that makes fun of this fails to mention is that it's not about Katana. It was a punchline setup. The Suicide Squad doesn't care. That's the whole point. Flag was trying to scare them and Harley turned it into a joke. Love your perfume. What is that? The scent of death? Does anyone look scared? Deadshot and Boomerang are smiling and Diablo isn't even paying attention. Now, if you don't think Harley's funny, that's another story. I do, so it's a win. But seriously, they're all more upset about Croc puking. Two things here. I love that the second they hit the ground, everyone is immediately trying to escape. It's exactly what they would be doing. And the second is Boomerang tricking Slipknot into being his patsy to test the water. The squad's first fight together establishes that baddies will kill you and showcases each member's unique fighting style and talents in a fun way. Saving the guy who holds your life in his hands. First off, do I hear Zimmer and Junkie XL's Batman theme in there? Makes sense since this might be the most awesome and heroic scene in the film. You have to love Deadshot taking control and showing off his ridiculous skills. I mean, yeah! Now that's love, I mean crazy. Somewhere else. Oh. Brutal. God, if you weren't so crazy, I'd think you were insane. Go away. Shades of the way Joker treats her in the cartoon and comics. But there's actually more to their story that they're purposefully unraveling slowly. They cut most of this scene out and it's definitely something that should have been left in. It legitimizes Harley's previous profession as she psychoanalyzes everyone and shows her even darker side while she uses those skills to mess with people just because she's upset. A mind to pry apart and spit in. And we get a little more Katana sans mask. So Harley actually has some pretty sweet moves. Saving and protecting the guy with his finger on the button again. Yep, Harley gets it. I'd like to talk about something that comes up in negative reviews, plot structure. You have to understand that Harley's story is told in flashbacks throughout the film because she's being developed slowly to tie into our main theme of love. Up until this moment, she just seemed crazy. Now we know that the Joker loves her back and it gives her this moment with Deadshot to propel his arc forward. The structure is well planned out. And everything about this scene is spectacular. The slow, fearless and effortless jump to the pan out of swirling insanity bonding these two together forever, so good. She takes an average person. She turns him into a soldier who can take a headshot and still fight. It's an instant army. The ever evil Waller is always looking for an angle, even in the face of Armageddon. Professor, could you pick up the pay? And that's what he needed this guy for in case you were confused by this scene previously. Our nanites disarmed! Heart of gold for Flag, since he could have just shot her right there, showing us whose team he's really on now, and a heart of gold for Deadshot as well. I missed. A genuine moment between two people trying to understand love. A moment with so much unsaid but implied. Such as, thanks for not shooting me, and sorry your lover blew up. Another scene that gets flack for messing up the pacing, but it's a pivotal scene. It humanizes the entire squad, even Diablo with his admission of guilt. Now we understand why he doesn't want to fight, but it also sets up his final sacrifice. Oh my Something that really sets Suicide Squad apart. It's not forced to ask some of the same questions other comic book movies ask. Great power, great responsibility, yada yada. It's an examination of how to exist and come to terms with the evil you've done. They only touch on it briefly because this is ultimately an origin story. I'm beautiful. Yeah, you are. Self-confidence and compliments. You're free to go. <laughs> you gotta love Boomerang. <laughs> All right, I'll take an anti-hero walk with Stephen Price's triumphant score playing over top. You can't tell me not to smile. Yeah, we should uh, get a drink sometime. Appropriately timed courting. Enchantress and Incubus aren't the most complex villains, but they didn't really need to be. This movie's about getting the Suicide Squad together over a common goal. Visually, I think they're awesome. Her mind control powers play with our theme and test each of our anti-heroes so that they have to come together. And it's not like they're boring. Ancient magical dudes are upset they were locked in jars for a millennia, taking their wrath out on the technology-obsessed humans. Remember this? Normals is setting on the dryer! Turns out, that's what she actually wants. And I'm starting to think she was pregnant. I love the difference between Flag and Harley's visions. Harley is crazy. Her vision is crystal clear because it's easier for her to believe this reality, shown by how she almost walks out. Then Flag's vision is distorted and blurry like waking from a dream since he has a better grasp on reality. Let me show you what I really am. Yep. Brutal. Two self-sacrifices. 
Slow motion saving your new friend. Sorry. Apology win. A little defense of this ending. Yes, Enchantress is pretty much invincible. How could they ever beat her? But remember this? She wants to be worshipped. That's her entire plan. Destroy the machine so everyone will bow down to her. And serve beneath my feet. You messed with my friend! Pride before the fall. Enchantress's last resort effort. Realizing she missed the most important thing about Deadshot, thinking his hatred for the bat initially superseded his love for his daughter, but it's precisely his love for his daughter that makes him pull the trigger. <laughs> Team work. Hug it. Eh, honesty. June Moon's alive. Like in a building, mm. and you shoot a man down here on the street. Mm -hmm. That's how far the bullet actually goes? Math. Murder lessons. I love you, Daddy. I love you. And there it is. What he didn't believe he was worthy of in the beginning. Just killed a man. So, Queen is always a win, even if they did cut it way short. Well, the Joker's not going to be overlooked. You should shut it down. My friends and I will do it for you. Yes! Justice League v Suicide Squad 2024. Man, two dark movies in a row. I don't want you people out there to think I'm some kind of evil worshipper. I like good guys, and light, and nice things like puppies and rainbows. I promise the next two movies will be lighthearted and happy. But I do enjoy Breaking Bad and Dexter. There is something compelling about anti-heroes or complex villains. One of the most interesting things this film plays with is the contrast between Waller and the bad guys. It's a flip of typical tropes. Even though it hammers at home a little heavy at times, Waller is supposed to be the good guy, yet she's incapable of sympathy or compassion. She retells the villain's tragic backstories without a hint of empathy. In a film about bad guy heroes, I guess the flip should be expected. One of the biggest questions that comes up in reviews is why the Suicide Squad? Why not send Batman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash? The reason is that Waller needed some expendable goons she could control since she created the entire catastrophe. It's that simple. The first mission was rescuing her, where she planned to execute a bunch of underlings, solidifying her ruthless status. Do you think Batfleck would have been on board for that? No. Suicide Squad is less of a comic book ensemble film, though it does end up there. It's more about the individual character stories. That's the reason the majority of the film is one day or one evening. To try to introduce these characters in a way other than flashbacks would have made the movie feel jumbled and all over the place. Maybe you think it's jumbled and all over the place anyway, but that's the reason it was done this way. Deadshot, Flag, Harley, and Diablo to a slightly lesser extent are the main characters. Boomerang is comic relief, Slipknot was thrown in there just so Flag could prove he was serious and that there was an actual threat to the squad's lives. The rest of the characters were just there for Flash and to add to the supernatural element of the DC Universe. And maybe add side character continuity for other solo films? We'll see, I guess. The main four are all equally responsible for illustrating the primary theme of this film. Each is a damaged person that either doesn't understand or believe in love, doesn't believe love can exist in the same heart as one with so many transgressions, or is doing everything they can to atone for failing the ones they love. Each character draws out their own arc and learns something about love in themselves. Deadshot is the biggest arc in realizing the importance of his love for his daughter. It's what leads him to sincerely empathize with Flag after he admits to the nature of his relationship with June. Diablo's story is the most straightforward with his guilt over killing his family, but I found him to be an interesting character mixed in amongst the baddies. He's the only redeemable character right from the beginning, of this day at least, who sacrifices himself when he realizes he has a chance to save the only family he has now. Harley Quinn's love is the most complex and is maybe a bit closer to Stockholm Syndrome at times. But the Joker literally broke her brain. Your perception is your reality, and she loves him. Once she passes his test of fitting into the idea of the Joker, he's willing to bring her along for the ride, and ends up risking everything to save her. The reason he's barely more than a cameo in this movie is because to serve this story, he can only be Harley's origin. Had he been a bigger part, he would have overshadowed everyone just by being the Joker. Which brings me to Jared Leto's Joker. His performance is going to come down to personal preference. I give him credit for going for it. Leto is an amazing actor and he's capable of great things. Part of the problem with this Joker incarnation is the way they're presenting him. He's not meant to have a backstory or any solid motivations. He just kind of is. He says himself. He's a concept. Just a compilation of crazy, really. And as great as both Nicholson and Ledger's Jokers were, would you have believed either of them could have a girlfriend? Maybe Nicholson, but definitely not Ledger. He was too busy watching the world burn. Leto's Joker is a gangster and the type that would absolutely do some of the more insanely ridiculous things comic Joker has done. I feel the need to say that you're not an idiot if you didn't like this movie. I'd never claim you just didn't get it. There's not a whole lot of complex stuff to get. The themes are there if you want to look for them. If you didn't enjoy this film, that's totally fine. But the rest of you that did, please do not feel shame for that. You are not alone. Personally, I rank this film above a couple MCU films. Don't be fooled into believing this film is objectively bad. Now, don't get me wrong. Does it follow a typical three-act structure? Is every performance Oscar-worthy? Is the storytelling completely coherent at all times? Do any of those things matter when judging a film for enjoyment value? Well, some of you would obviously debate me on this. I do not believe something created for entertainment can be judged objectively. It's kind of the point of this channel, but I digress. 
Will Smith easily gets the best moments and he Will Smiths as good as he ever does. Margot Robbie is Harley Quinn. Her accent is all over the place and she really nailed the character all the way from calm, collected Quinzel to bonkers Quinn. I know a lot of you hated Joel Kinnaman's flag, but I've got blinders on for the guy. The killing is amazing, seriously go watch it. And I found him to be a fine foil for Deadshot. Aside from that, Carl Delevingne, I, uh, Carl De Delevingne? 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 She was fun as the witch, but proved she could rein it in as Moon. My biggest complaint is really just give us more. Make it a three hour movie. The extended cut gave us a little more relationship building between Flag and Moon and also delved into Harley and Joker's origin a bit more too. So some slight improvements. Did it need to be a world ending event? Well, all I can say is that the comic book movie world is an unforgiving climate right now. So much to compete with, so many people to please, from the comic book nerds to the general audience members to the critics who often decide the fate of your box office return. And that's not even counting the people behind the scenes trying to stick to a ridiculous schedule put forth by the studios. So enjoy what you enjoy and don't worry about the rest. Don't be swayed by critical opinion. There is a reason that films fall into cult classic status. I'm not saying Suicide Squad is definitely headed there, but it's a perfect example of fan and critic disagreement. In the meantime, we have Wonder Woman and Justice League to look forward to. And there's no way the critics will be unfair to those two films, right? Right? Batflex their darling now. Right? Whatever, I'll be here. You hear me? Huh? Please don't touch me. Please don't touch me.